Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to St Paul's and particularly to this event. My name's Tricia Hillis, I'm one of the clergy here at St Paul's and I inhabit the role of the canon pastor here. Dr Jane Williams, whom we're delighted to welcome, is Assistant Dean and Lecturer in Systemic Th Systematic Theology at St Melitus College. The college and her work resource and equip prospective clergy and others in training and we hope that via them also all of us. Jane is quite simply a wonderful theologian. She brings to her academic life and teaching not only her brilliant mind but a depth and a breadth of human understanding and a very real and deep cultural life. She takes paintings and novels theologically seriously. She's written about them with love and insight. Jane is, as you I'm sure know, the author of numerous academic and popular works of theology, including the brilliant and for which I was very grateful, concise, Why Did Jesus Have to Die? Her latest book, the Merciful Humility of God is the Bloomsbury book for Lent this year, and it's that book that we'll be exploring together. In it, Jane invites us to explore how God works for our salvation in ways that are gentle and subtle, so much so that it's easy to overlook their power and their force. Going to invite Jane almost immediately now to come and speak with us for about 40 minutes, which then will allow us, of course, time for questions. And so we'll invite you to share those a little later. We will, as we always promise to, finish promptly at two o'clock this afternoon. So would you please join me in welcoming our speaker, Thank you so much, Tricia, and thank you to all of you for coming out on this uh, miserable Sunday. Um, particular thanks to those of you sitting very uncomfortably. I um, apologise for that, um, and we'll attempt not to talk for so long that you get cramp. Um, but feel free to stand up if you do. Okay. Um, when I was preparing this talk last week, um, I was thinking of a nice uh, introduction to Lent. The word probably is an old English word meaning spring, and of course last week it did look like spring, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, so I thought, great, we can go from there. Um, because what I would love us to think about as we approach Lent is not so much the traditional giving things up, although it may involve that. It's, the perp it's what we're doing it for. What's the point? And the spring image is rather a lovely one because um, I, I tend to think that what we're doing is um, looking at, at, at all the weeds that have grown up in our uh, spiritual garden, in our journey with with God um, over the last year, weeds that have grown up that we probably haven't even noticed, that are beginning to spring up and choke things. Uh, and um, Lent is giving us a chance to do a bit of gardening in our relationship with God and to dig up the things that aren't meant to be there, to make space for the things that are meant to be there to grow. So I'm assuming um, that what's one of the reasons why people are usually happy to do a bit of work in Lent is it's a chance um, to seriously pay a bit more attention to what's shaping our lives. Um, and in particular, to notice the things that have crept in that actually are making our decisions for us, whether we notice it or not. Um, habits that we didn't really think had become habits until we stopped doing them and realised that we missed them badly. Habits that are actually shaping uh, the people that we are becoming, uh, but often quite unintentionally. So a chance to be a little bit intentional um, in Lent about what it is that we are becoming. Now I'm getting some puzzled looking faces from the back. Am I audible? Yeah. Just about? Okay, excellent. So that's just because I'm not making any sense and that's another matter altogether. <laughs> Um, and I, do, I probably don't need to tell this audience that, of course, we, we spend uh, 40 days, so that's the, the weeks up until Holy Week and Easter, not counting the Sundays, uh, and those 40 days are our are, are chance to uh, journey with Jesus in his time in the wilderness. 
um, which is the tradition of Lent. Um, and again, it's important to remember what Jesus is doing in that wilderness. Uh, he goes to the wilderness immediately after his baptism. Uh, and the baptism is one of those highlights of the Gospels when we're told as unmistakably as possible who Jesus is. Um, at his baptism, Jesus hears the voice of the Father saying, you are my beloved, and he feels the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, who is visible in the form of a dove. So Jesus goes into the desert with that huge affirmation ringing in his ears. And again, I'd love us to start Lent there. I have suggested in my book that throughout Lent we start every morning uh, by letting God say to us, you are my beloved. How difficult is that? Um, it, it's extraordinary, isn't it? It's the most basic thing we as Christians want to say, that God loves us. And it's the, the thing that most people find hardest to believe. So again, setting a new habit throughout Lent of starting there uh, with God's love for us. And then what Jesus does is to take that affirmation, you are my beloved, into the wilderness to explore what it means to be the beloved one of God. Uh, and to ensure that throughout his ministry, um, that's where he lives from. That's where he makes his decisions from. That this is going to be his vocation as it is ours. From this point, we will make all our decisions. What does it mean to be the beloved of the Father? And not, therefore, to be entirely in control of his own destiny. Um, and then to go back at the beginning of Lent and have a look at uh, the accounts uh, of the temptation in the wilderness. Marx is extremely short, uh, Matthew and Luke very similar, slightly longer. Um, uh, and what they tell us, uh, particularly Matthew and Luke, is that in the wilderness Jesus resists temptations to use the Father's love, um, to use it for his own ends. He won't turn stones into bread. He won't accept fame and homage from anywhere but the Father. He won't ask God to keep him safe under all circumstances. Um, and uh, so at this point, it isn't about Jesus. It's not about self-denial. Uh, it's primarily about working out what is going to shape the rest of his life, the decisions that will shape his ministry. Um, and we see that playing out in all of the rest of the gospel witness to Jesus Christ. And that under all circumstances, wherever you touch Jesus, wherever you um, uncover anything about Jesus, what you find is that he's acting from that place uh, as the beloved son of the Father. Um, and that will be the basic affirmation of his life and all of his actions. Um, and any actions and choices that don't spring from that point will be ruled out. So I'd love us to see um, how that primary place shapes who Jesus is and how Jesus acts. And again, to think then for ourselves, what is the most important thing that we would love to shape our lives? Um, how will we allow that most important thing to determine all the decisions that we make um, and become a little bit more intentional about those decisions? Because this um, wilderness experience that the Gospels describe for us uh, is at the heart of what we see in the rest of Jesus' ministry uh, and perhaps above all in his death on the cross. If he uh, gives in to that temptation to ask God to keep him safe, then the death on the cross is not possible uh, and the whole of our salvation, therefore, is undermined. Um, and throughout the Gospel narrative, then, we see Jesus resisting uh, all the temptations to use his ministry for his own power or his own safety, uh, living only and always as the Son of the Father. So what we see, then, in the life of Jesus, lived out and witnessed to by the Gospels, um, is the pattern of God's life lived out in our world, the pattern of the self-giving love. The Father is always the Father of the Son. That's why he's called the Father because of the Son. The Son is always the Son of the Father. That's why we call him the Son, because uh, of the relationship with the Father. The Spirit is always creating these, uh, what I want to call filial-shaped responses um, to the Father. Filial because it's a good gender-neutral word. It applies to sons and daughters um, in outgoing love. 
Um, and so the God that we see operating in Jesus is this God who is self-giving love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, that defines um, who Jesus is and what Jesus shows us. God makes the world as a gift to be shared. We too come out of this self-giving love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God's relationship with us is as uh, that creative self-giving that we see in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, drawing us into relationship with God and so with each other, where we too are defined primarily, our primary definition as children of God, sisters and brothers of the Son, living from the Spirit's loving creativity. Um, and of course, uh, that sounds lovely, but the other thing that we see in the Gospel testimony to Jesus is that that pattern of relating, that pattern of choosing, that what will define us will be this overriding thing, that we are the beloved ones of God, that pattern is no longer natural in our world, and it provokes hostility, uh, as we see in Jesus. Ultimately, all those around Jesus find it impossible to live from that overriding central point, and they crucify him. And the Gospels are very clear that absolutely everybody involved in the ministry of Jesus is culpable in that decision to crucify Jesus. The rulers, the religious authorities, the ordinary people of Jerusalem, and Jesus' friends, all of them abandon him. Uh, they are offered the choices that Jesus makes in the wilderness, uh, and they choose, as we choose, over and over again, self-definition, self-rule, self-determination about what uh, God can and cannot ask of us. We make uh, our own decisions irrespective of God. And the extraordinary thing, and one of the things that I'm hoping, us, hoping to see as we read the book, if you choose to read the book over Lent, is this pattern of what God does with our reactions. Because of course, uh, God does not stop the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He doesn't stop that rejection of God's love and service. Um, but equally, God does not accept it as the final decision. He does not accept it uh, as the definition of what uh, humanity's relationship with God is going to be, because Jesus is raised from the dead. So that even human rejection becomes a way, the most powerful way, for God to be with us, offering us a love and a service that cannot be broken, that cannot be forced to act differently. Nothing will make God reject us or stop loving us. So God the Son goes into suffering and death as the one rejected by human beings, um, and now even those places of suffering and death and rejection are full of God, places where God continues to offer friendship and con companionship. And so one of the things I'm trying to do uh, in my book is to explore why this is the way of God and why that's good news for us. Uh, and I try to look at it through the life of Jesus, from his birth, uh, through his choice of friends, and the places and people to whom he ministers, and the places and people to whom he doesn't, um, through his death and into his resurrection. And what I'm arguing is that what, God, what Jesus shows us is, is this extraordinary humility of God, which is not a, a meek and mild characteristic, it's a powerful, forceful, a willingness always uh, to be at our service, uh, uh, showing us a God whose love is always serving. Um, it's particularly noticeable in the Gospels uh, that those who know they need service are most ready to accept what Jesus offers. So at the heart of the Gospel stories are the poor, the sick, the outcast, women and children, people who know they don't have the power to define their own worlds. Whereas, um, unfortunately, for those of us who are comfortable and well-off and self-satisfied and reasonably powerful, uh, these are the ones that we see uh, not willing to let Jesus shape their lives because uh, these people are used to deciding what they need and used to being able to get it for themselves. Uh, and so God is always at the periphery of a system that works pretty well for those people. Um, 
I love that interaction between Pilate and Jesus um, just before the crucifixion in, in St. John's Gospel because um, Pilate just can't make Jesus give him what Pilate expects people to give him. Um, uh, and Jesus simply doesn't recognize Pilate's self-understanding. Pilate sees himself as the one who has the power in this relationship. Uh, and Jesus just doesn't seem to see that at all. He simply, although he's about to be put to death, assumes that he is the one in control of this relationship. Uh, and the irony, St. John means us to see this irony, and it gets more and more ironic as time passes, is that Pilate, of course, is long dead and remembered only because of his role in relationship to Jesus. Uh, and the empire he serves has crumbled, but Jesus is alive and sits at the right hand of God forever. So who was right? Um, you can see in Jesus' ministry that his willingness to offer unfailing mercy and friendship makes space for people to grow in dignity and worth. And again, speaks of how God serves us, always bringing out in us that family likeness, one of the things that we as Christians are always looking for in other people, that sense, oh yes, I see Jesus in you, you are my sibling. Um, and uh, that sense that we are the beloved ones of God and shows how God particularly upholds those who cannot assert this, cannot demand it for themselves. Um, Jesus puts a child at the heart of his demonstration of what it takes to be a disciple. Jesus washes his disciples' feet, that wonderfully moving ceremony that we recreate on Maundy Thursday in Holy Week. Jesus washes his disciples as though he were a slave. Um, he entrusts the news of the resurrection, first of all, to women. Um, as St. Paul says, probably a little bit too frankly for his Corinthian audience, um, uh, he chooses the likes of us to be his followers uh, and his evangelists. Paul says that our main qualification as Christians is that we don't have any qualifications. Um, so we can't for one moment deceive ourselves that this is about us or our good ideas or our great talents. God's humility is merciful because it sees us all as equally beloved and equally sisters and brothers of the Son. This is not something that needs to be earned and there's nothing we can do to alienate it. It's simply given to us. Um, that lovely parable again of the prodigal son and the older son, both of them beloved, both of them finding it hard to believe that God can really love the one if they love the other. There is room in God's love for all. Um, and of course this is a lovely idea uh, uh, but it can sound very abstract and it can um, make us feel, well, that's all very well for God. <laughs> what about us? Um, and in the book, uh, one of the ways in which I try to take us deeper into what it might be like for us is to look at some of the people who have really lived as though they are actually defined by this relationship with God uh, and as though that's the place from which they're going to make all the decisions. Um, they live from that, they make cho choices based on that. Um, I start with Augustine of Hippo in the 4th century. I'm, I'm a bit prone to start with Augustine on any possible <laughs> occasion, if I possibly can. And um, uh, when the publisher came to me to talk about this idea, the, the, the title is the publisher's idea, um, but he couldn't remember where it came from. But the minute he said it, I thought Augustine. Um, because it is uh, one of Augustine's great discoveries about the nature of God. You know a little bit about the story of Augustine of Hippo? Um, if, uh, maybe not because you haven't all been in my lectures so far. Um, uh, but uh, he, he's a wonderfully appealing um, warts and all kind of character. He describes himself um, in his uh, sort of uh, philosophical theological autobiography which is called Confessions um, and I'd rather you read that than read my book although I'm meant to be here selling my book I'd rather you read the Confessions during Lent truthfully um, uh, and he describes himself um, uh, he shows himself to be a, a rather arrogant very clever um, and quite insecure young man um, born in provincial North Africa on the edge of the uh, Roman Empire uh, and he gets himself a prestigious job in Milan uh, as a rhetor, which is at the heart of civilization in the Roman Empire, being able to speak well, teaching others how to speak well. Um, and he describes his ongoing search um, for something uh, that he knows he hasn't quite got, 
He's never quite satisfied. Um, he speaks of his search for a theology that will let him feel good about himself, which I suspect is a theology that we're all looking for, um, uh, that, uh, that will allow him to justify himself and his choices um, in his own eyes, that will uh, excuse him from feeling ashamed about the things that he is actually ashamed about, that will somehow put uh, the blame somewhere else and allow him to carry on living as he wants to. Um, and he speaks uh, uh, of um, his final, almost shipwrecked discovery um, of God waiting for him. Uh, there's that wonderful conversion story that he, uh, where he finally gives in to God. Um, uh, and you see that Augustine has come to the end of his tether. He's, um, he's it's physically ill, he's clearly on the edge of a breakdown, and he's sitting in a garden sobbing his heart out, um, deeply ashamed of himself because uh, he's reading about people like uh, St. Anthony of Egypt who didn't have an education. It's interesting that Augustine notices that, having thought that education was so important. And he notices that some of the great saints of God haven't got any education and are still able to do things that he, Augustine, cannot. Um, and at last, uh, Augustine uh, hears uh, through his self, his, this fog of, of self-hatred, what he takes to be the voices of children playing somewhere in the garden, uh, calling, pick it up and read it, pick it up and read it. And he looks around, to, 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 he starts off thinking, what, is there a game that goes pick it up and read it, pick it up? Um, and it, it, he looks around and sees an open book of St Paul's epistles, picks them up and reads them. And from that moment, as he tells the story, uh, finds a new direction for his life. I think it's, again, a sense of God's, uh, a sign of God's sense of humour, uh, that this arrogant young man hears the voice of small children bringing him to this moment of conversion. Uh, and Augustine describes uh, the humble God who comes to make himself what Augustine calls a house of our clay. He comes to live in this stuff that we're made of uh, so as to be close to us, to get as close to us as possible uh, and to share with us what we could never grab by our own power, which is the life and love of God. And Augustine says that um, finally, exhausted, having looked around all over uh, the intellectual universe uh, for a, a way to live that was satisfying for him, he finally fell down in exhaustion and found God waiting at his feet, uh, ready to lift him up with the life and love of God, the humble God. Um, the, the book was basically an opportunity for me to talk about some of my favourite um, Christian practitioners. So I went from Augustine to Julian of Norwich. Um, again, uh, if you haven't read Julian, put her on your reading list, Revelations of Divine Love. Um, uh, we call her Julian of Norwich, but we don't actually know her name. She's called that because she spent most of her life uh, walled into the side of a church, St Julian's Church in Norwich, and that's where she takes her name from. Uh, we know almost nothing about her life before this, and she doesn't bother to tell us because she's not interested in that. Um, uh, we nearly lost her book. Um, it was one of those extraordinary... Uh, narrow misses. It's, uh, somebody found a manuscript of it uh, in the 19th century after almost it being almost unknown for centuries before that. Um, uh, it's as though God sort of put it aside for us. Um, it's as though our generation um, needs to hear uh, that message of God's love and needs to hear it in a woman's voice. Uh, it's very interesting that Julian made no particular effort to ensure that uh, it had widespread dissemination during her lifetime. She spent uh, all of the, the years after uh, her, her first experience of God just simply meditating on what she'd seen. Uh, it, it, the book starts with Julian um, lying on what she assumes is going to be her deathbed and everybody around her assumes it's her deathbed. Uh, and so the priest who comes to administer the last rites to her holds before her eyes a crucifix uh, and the crucifix sort of comes to life in Julian's dying eyes, and she sees uh, the dying Jesus Christ. Um, uh, and what she sees and hears uh, from this vision is the assurance of God's love and God's willingness to undergo anything in order to be close to her in this time of fear and pain. What she sees is a vision of that humble love that will go anywhere to be with the beloved. Um, and so when Julian unexpectedly recovered, 
um, she gave the rest of her life to meditating on these showings, these visions that she had. And there's a shorter version and a longer version. Um, and she s sits um, in the side of St. Julian's Church, writing of the unfailing love of God. It's, it's revolutionary theology. She doesn't um, have in her job title, unlike me, lecture in systematic theology. Um, but uh, what she's doing is quite revolutionary theology because uh, she is insistent um, that God is not interested in condemning us. Why would God go to all the bother um, of the incarnation and uh, death and resurrection if uh, all that was going to be the result of that was that we still had to earn our way into heaven? Uh, Julian sees the dying Jesus Christ as the assurance that God has done everything to be with us and to draw us into his love. So towards the end of her book, um, Julian asks God uh, for a summary of what she has learned over all these years. And this is what the Lord answers her. You would know our Lord's meaning in this thing? Know it well. Love was his meaning. Who showed it to you? Love. What did he show you? Love. Why did he show it? For love. Hold on to this and you will know and understand love more and more. But you will not know or learn anything else ever. And so for Julian, that's our lifetime's work, is actually exploring the love of God. Um, getting deeper and deeper and deeper into it so that the places in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds that really cannot believe that that is the truth that we'll never know anything else ever about God that is at all important um, begin to be saturated in this discovery. Um, I go on to look at um, Francis of Assisi uh, again somebody that most of us know quite a bit about if only that he loved uh, the natural world. Uh, one of the things that struck me in exploring Francis is that Francis, as a, an idealistic uh, young man, was really interested in battles. Um, he, he longed to go and be a warrior. He had all kinds of romantic uh, fantasies about that. Um, and then went through a period of illness um, where he basically lost interest in life. Can you see there's, there's a little bit of a theme here? Um, it is not absolutely universal, but it's interesting how often uh, some of the great um, writers on um, mystical theology actually have a, a place where an encounter with illness that means that they realise that we're not in control of our lives. There are some things that we just can't control. Uh, and that enables them to step over into that space where they relinquish control and let God do the controlling. And Francis has this uh, experience of really thinking, I can't be bothered with the world anymore at all. Um, uh, and then, his, again, his great conversion to uh, the love of God, um, which uh, in Francis's case meant that he quite dramatically gave up uh, everything. There's that lovely image that we're told about that when his uh, father gets very angry at everything that Francis has given away that didn't belong to Francis, that belonged to his father. His father says, will, will you give it all back? And Francis gives it all back. He takes all his clothes off and hands everything back. There's that really dramatic streak in Francis. Um, but the thing that really struck me in rereading his biography, and there's some very good online biography, it's quite easy. Uh, there's somebody called Thomas of um, I'm going to say Celano, but as I'm not Italian, that may be entirely the wrong pronoun pronunciation. It's C-E-L-A-N-O. His biography of Francis is online. And um, what, he, uh, what really struck me about that biography was he describes Francis's ecstatic joy in creation. It's as though having given up everything, he's given back this real joy and love of the world, this ability to attend to the world in a very particular kind of way. Um, apparently he loved, Francis loved sheep and lambs as symbols of the Lamb of God. Um, we're told that he, uh, if he saw a worm on the path that he was walking along, he would pick it up and put it safely out of the way so it didn't get trodden on. Um, because why would a worm not be as important as we are? Uh, he made sure that bees had honey or wine to feed on in cold weather so that they didn't die. Um, he loved flowers and he preached to them as he did to the birds because he trusted that they too were creatures of God and would love to hear about God and sh would share in the good news. Um, and th it's that contrast between this ecstatic love of nature um, 
uh, and that listless lack of pleasure in everything that beset him after his illness and before his conversion. It's as though God gave <coughs> Francis back the deepest riches once Francis realised that only God can give what belongs only to God. Um, I go on to look at Therese of Avila, as you can see, all my favourites here. Um, uh, and uh, again, with Teresa, it's an encounter with the suffering and dying Christ that brings her back to the point where she could again feel the loving presence uh, of God in her prayers. Teresa talks about a longish period in her life where she doesn't feel as though God's close, she doesn't feel as though she can pray, she doesn't feel as though she knows anything about God. Um, and uh, she describes suddenly noticing a statue of the dying Jesus, which seemed to her to be looking at her. Um, uh, and looking at her with a deep and patient love. It's not accusing, it's just waiting for Teresa to notice uh, God's love. And his patient willingness to hang and suffer for Teresa, while she could hardly even be bothered to pray, pierced her to the heart. Uh, and Teresa came again to a place of real humility that enabled her to see the humble God there waiting for her. Um, most of us know Teresa as a, um, a, a person, a mystical writer about the, the life of prayer with extraordinary depth. Um, she uh, was known to uh, even to levitate while praying. She found that terribly embarrassing because um, she didn't think that was the point of it at all. Uh, the, it, we, we don't pray in order to have those wonderful ecstatic feelings. We pray in order to maintain our closeness with God and allow God to maintain God's cl closeness with us. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and so again, we tend to, to uh, see Teresa's system of prayer and think that's what we're meant to be imitating, rather than seeing what Teresa herself was pointing to, which was the humble God who reached out for her and enabled that relationship to be restored. Um, she talks about uh, our, um, the need to just carry on praying. This is a lovely description of it. Uh, she talks about our prayer activity as, quote, like the little donkeys that draw the water wheel. Though their eyes are shut and they have no idea what they're doing, these donkeys will draw more water than the gardener can with all his efforts. Um, I don't know about you, but I quite often feel like a donkey with my eyes shut when I'm praying. And I find this very comforting. I don't need to know what I'm doing. I don't need to feel things. I just need to trust that as I uh, stay with God, so something will happen and I will, in some sense, be part of God's watering of the garden. Uh, and then finally, um, I look at Jean Vanier, uh, who is one of the founders, as you know, of the L'Arche communities, communities where so-called able-bodied and so-called disabled people share life together. And that so-called is important for Vanier um, because one of his great discoveries is that actually uh, we are, uh, those of us who think we're able-bodied are disabled in all kinds of ways and have so much to learn from people who have been taught uh, how to exist in, in the fragility uh, of their physical existence. And Vanier um, reflects on the unacknowledged consequences for our world uh, of an attitude um, that values greater and greater power and control and success. So Vanier is the most, obviously, contemporary, he's still alive, of, of, of the writers that I look at. And he's describing a world that is very definitely uh, a world that I recognise. Uh, he describes a society that's orientated towards success and that therefore um, will, even without meaning to, discard uh, those that it sees as unsuccessful. Uh, it will, without meaning to, demand more and more of the Earth's resources because success is the, is the thing that's shaping all its decisions. Um, and therefore you don't question uh, the, the things that might make you wonder if, if we're going the right direction, because this is the defining thing that uh, makes all our decisions. Um, and as I say, these are not the stated goals of a competitive and success-driven individual culture. We don't say we're going to discard the unsuccessful and we're going to demand the endless resources of the earth. That's not the stated goal. And that means that very often uh, it, it's not observed that that is what's actually happening. Um, don't observe the terrible damage that is being done by this uh, concentration on success. And so Vanier describes what we're all seeing, the depletion of the Earth's resources um, uh, and the fact that it's always the poor and the powerless who feel the effects of this first. 
because the world is run by the rich and successful in their own interests. Uh, and Vanier is quite clear-sighted about this. It's not sustainable um, because actually there are more poor and <laughs> vulnerable and needy people in the world than there are rich and successful ones. And at some point, that balance is going to tip. Um, and so the world is, becomes increasingly violent and unstable as the poor fight for life and the rich fight for control. Does that, do you recognise that description, one possible description of the world? And so one of the, again, the things that Vanier is asking us to consider is uh, what is at the heart of how we live our lives and make our decisions. Uh, and one of the interpretive keys that uh, Vanier discovered for himself in living in large communities um, is uh, to explore reality from the point of view of what he calls the heart. And he writes this, the heart is never successful. It does not want power, honours, privilege or efficiency. It seeks a personal relationship with another, a communion of hearts. Uh, and the thing about that deep longing, this longing for a communion of hearts, um, is that it can't be fulfilled, we can't satisfy that longing uh, without opening ourselves up to vulnerability. Um, the communion of hearts can't be achieved if personal safety and success come first. Uh, and you can't pick and choose exactly, I will let that person in because that person is going to be safe for me to be vulnerable with. Um, because uh, to admit that, um, the heart need, to admit that this is what the heart needs, is to critique a description of the world that doesn't prioritise that need. If I need that communion of hearts, then others need it too. Why is my need um, overriding of other people's needs for that uh, communion of hearts, as Vianney describes it? Um, and so to, den to ask for that for ourselves, what we long for, that connection, while denying it to others, um, is self-contradictory. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and one of the insights that Vanier uh, gets from his interaction in the L'Arche community is that people with disabilities don't have the choices that others sometimes believe they have. People with disabilities cannot avoid vulnerability and dependence. And so they must live in this way of the heart, this way of connection with others, where success and efficiency and power are not the main currency. And for Vanier, that was one of the great gifts he was given by these communities, this acknowledgement that actually that is what we all need and long for. Uh, and uh, we need to, to help the world to uh, live from that place where that is what we offer to each other. So. What I'm hoping we might do over Lent is explore this um, idea of life-giving mercy, the life-giving mercy of God, and why it's merciful for us. Uh, and the question is whether we are willing to, do, to be defined like this. Will this. Are we willing to let this be the heart of how we make all our decisions? Are we willing to start from that place as God's beloved children, to sisters and brothers of the Son, which means sisters and brothers of each other? Um, this Lent discipline, what might that look like in our lives? We're not called, all of us, to be St Francis of Assisi or Julian of Norwich or even Jean Vanier, um, but we are called to this primary place of who we are willing to be uh, in the love of God. Uh, and so in Lent what we're doing is watching Jesus, the human being that God becomes um, is what I've already called filial, shaped by that relationship with the Father. Um, uh, and Jesus lives in the world as though this is the true definition of humanity. This is what it is to be a human being, to be the ones shaped by that primary love uh, between us and God. And uh, it, so Jesus defines humanity as though uh, humanity is to be connected with God as child to parent, with all the vulnerability uh, and dependence, trust and likeness that that implies. Jesus' way of being in the world suggests that love is the main definition of God's power. 
And the resurrection and ascension confirm that that's not just a temporary state, not just something we see in the incarnation, uh, but true and lasting reality in God. God is for us as father for children. God is with us as brother among siblings. The Holy Spirit renews this in water, in bread, in wine, making human beings into the body of Christ, uh, which is the pattern of life-giving human and divine interrelationship. Human beings, therefore, are called to be filial, to live as daughters and sons, sisters and brothers to each other. We're called to choose this as our definition of ourselves, as Jesus did, and therefore to make this the choice that affects all the other choices that we make. This, the place from which we make all our decisions about how we will live. And so Jesus doesn't choose to be safe and protected because as Jean Vanier has pointed out, that's not an option for love. Jesus does not choose to be successful if success is measured by our usual standards. Um, it's extraordinary, isn't it, uh, that he meets only a few people, some of whom he heals, some of whom he annoys, some of whom come to love him, um, some are brokenhearted when he dies, uh, and the people that he connects with are not the history makers, but the ones on the margins of all the usual narratives about who shapes the world and how. Um, Augustine is often blamed for this description of the Holy Spirit. Augustine, because it sort of seems to depersonalize the Holy Spirit, Augustine calls the Holy Spirit the bond of love. I love it because it's talking about something so strong that it can't be broken even by forsakenness and death. Uh, and so the resurrection is the sheer unimaginable power of the Holy Spirit, that love between the Father and the Son that no force in existence can overcome. Uh, the resurrection is the unbreakable reality as demonstrating the love of God. It needs no protection, it needs no force, it needs no other power. The greatest destructive power in the universe, death, cannot prevail against this love. The love of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit is truer and stronger than anything. And since death and destruction can't unmake that love, it is the future of every past, it is where we are all headed, it is the truth about each of our lives. Jesus' human story should have ended at the cross, but it didn't. It becomes a story with an infinite future, inviting all stories into it to find unimaginable newness. We too are invited to become children of God so that our lives and our stories are joined to this unbreakable love of God and so can have unimaginable futures. In Jesus, we see God's humility lived out in the world, not claiming power or prestige or approval or safety. And we come to discover, I hope, that this is a mercy and a blessing for us because we are no longer measured by success or failure. Um, uh, and so we don't have to live with the fact that actually everybody fails, everybody. Perhaps those who never had any illusions about their own abilities find it easiest to accept the merciful humility of God that notices them and makes space for them and draws them in as valued parts of the human story valued parts of that story of being called into relationship with God. The wealthy, the powerful, the successful may find this harder to understand until uh, we too come up against something that we simply can't control or overcome, such as our own mortality. And there may be space in God's mercy even for the powerful if they know that the true measure of their power, like Jesus's, uh, was how far it was used to give and receive true humanity from others. So that's what we see in Jesus as we walk through Lent, watching his ways. Uh, in Matthew 11, 25 to 30, Jesus is meditating on the intimate knowledge that Father and Son have of one another. Uh, and he turns from that to issue this invitation. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus' yoke is the one he chose consistently in his life, which is to be defined by relationship to God. All the other heavy burdens of living up to other, other demands can be put down under this yoke. That's why to serve God is perfect freedom. There's no place where God can't be found. Peacefully working an unimaginable future with the merciful and humble power of resurrection life. So choose this yoke in Lent and going forward. Thank you.
thank you so much. I'm about to open up to the room. I know you'll have questions uh, brewing. Um, actually, just before I ask an opening one, I would, wanted to say that uh, the saints you've chosen uh, resonate so strongly. Francis is someone who, for me, has been particularly uh, present. Um, and a little story is just when we were in Assisi, I was being super pious and <laughs> praying, you know, and w of course, and uh, discovering, you know, Francis's stigmata said to my husband, wouldn't it be amazing if I was so holy I had stigmata? I'm going to pray for this while I'm here. Until my husband pointed out that probably it would hurt. And at that point, <laughs> I stopped praying and realized that I am no Francis. Um, actually, a, a tricky question from me, if I can to begin, um, and more serious. That sense in which you were talking about Jesus from the outset and before living from that place of deep affirmation as God's beloved and then winding through Lent to where we will end in Holy Week, but not finish, what would you say that might say about the sense of abandonment of Christ on the cross? Can you, what does belovedness look like in the place of abandonment? That's a great question, Tricia. Um, and I hope will be one of the things that we that is preached on on Good Friday wherever if you're going to church on Good Friday. Um, it seems to me that that is the heart and depth of Jesus's identification with us. Um, that sense that uh, even this thing that I have said is is what defines Jesus totally that he is the beloved of the Father, even that Jesus gives up to be with us. So in that humiliation, as he calls out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's speaking on behalf of humanity. Uh, that's a, a cry that we see throughout human history and into today. You see it in the Psalms, you see it all over the world. God, what are you doing? Um, and, uh, and in a sense, in that um, total identification with us on the cross, seems to me that God is saying that is the question. That is the theological question. It's always seemed to me that every good Christian should um, never go away from that, that question of, the, uh, of innocent suffering. Um, that's the one that uh, through Jesus, through, through the cross, God says, yes, this is the question um, on which I uh, stand or fall, on which our relationship stands or falls. Um, and, and obviously the cross is not an answer, but it is God's willingness to be totally identified with those um, who feel there is no God. It's an extraordinary thing to be able to say, isn't it, that God goes into all those places that are furthest uh, from how we understand God, so that uh, that's where we will find God. Um, when um, you're speaking to people in the depth of despair and agony, uh, you're on the whole not going to give them this lecture, okay, this is not a helpful thing to do. Um, but because of God in Christ, you are really able to say to them, uh, even when God feels furthest, because of Jesus, we know he's closer than ever. And because it's God, that means there's something going on that is beyond our understanding and imagination. So it is the most extraordinary identification of, of Jesus with us, again, showing God's humble love. God is willing to, be, uh, to go where God is not in order to be with us. So, over to you. We do ask that, to allow as many of us to ask questions as possible, we keep them as concise as possible. I'm likely to repeat them um, so that particularly our friends who are listening via the video link will be able to hear. So, start there. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, this is a question I'm forming as I'm saying, so I hope it comes out okay. Um, this is something, what you've described today, about being willing to surrender uh, one's willfulness to God that I've been trying to contemplate in my life. And, and I'm struggling, if I'm honest, because uh, I suppose may, maybe it's my inability or unwillingness to surrender. But sometimes I, I get caught up in the question of, well, if God loves me, then surely God loves for me the things I want for me. 
even as I want to be the incarnation of God's love in the world. And I get caught up in what's my investment in a spiritual self I want to become. And what's my investment in I want that relationship to going to make me happy. In other words, what's stopping me from fully entering into the love that I've experienced and felt and known in moments of my life? And, and what's actually, well, that's perfectly fine because God wants to give you joy. God wants you to do the career that's going to bring you joy. Is that, is that part of what it means to walk with Jesus, to feel my joy? This is my question. Yeah. So a question about surrender and passions. And, yeah, personal passions. And desires. Personal desires. Thank you. Uh, and again, that's, I think, a question absolutely everybody in this room, if they're honest, would resonate with. Um, uh, and I, I, that's why, for me, it's really important to start from uh, that point of acknowledging that um, we are God's beloved. Uh, this is about a beneficent relationship in, in which what God longs is to see us most fully ourselves. Uh, and it's one of the extraordinary things about, um, uh, about those great Christians that we call saints is that they, mo they become more and more like themselves and more and more like Jesus at the same time. You think, how is that possible? But actually it is. But, um, it's one of the insights that, uh, that Augustine uh, brings, that um, we, it, it's absolutely no good trying to stamp down our passions, because that will always fail. Um, the only thing that's ever likely to make any difference to that is finding God more exciting than anything else. Uh, and so as we uh, go deeper and deeper into our passion for God, our other passions come into, um, into better harmony. Augustine says that we none of us desire anything that's actually bad. All our desires are actually good. It's just that we've got them out of sync so that we think that we can have things that are not related to God. Uh, whereas actually Augustine's great discovery is that everything beautiful has its reality in God, and therefore it's only as we see them uh, in our love of God uh, that they step into their true uh, relationship. So I think our great fear is always um, that God uh, wants us to give up things that we know are, are part of our reality. Um, and of course he doesn't. Why would he want to do that? But the question is, what is our reality? Um, and human history suggests we're really bad at knowing what's good for us, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, that actually we're the last people on earth who should uh, be asked about what we want because we're stupid and willful on the whole. Uh, but if we start from God and what God longs for for us uh, and that a willingness to open up our hearts to the sisters and brothers around us, then that might begin to help us uh, shape our desires. You know that great John Donne poem, Batter My Heart, Three-Personed God? Go away and Google it. Because again, Donne, a, a really passionate Dean of St. Paul's, um, uh, is, is talking about the fact that um, it's no good trying to get rid of passions. It's, it's only having a, a, a greater passion for God that's ever going to start to put us on the right path. Someone over here, yes. So a question about aspects of love and the, the nature of love for God and for others whom we love, maybe our spouse, and are they the same or how are they different? Um, I, I, I would want to argue that um, all love or beauty or truth, um, all uh, lasting reality uh, finds itself in God comes from God, is shaped by God, flows from God, uh, and therefore um, a, a real love that is self-giving, uh, that is longing for the good of another, such as you find in a, a, a deep marriage partnership, such as you find in true friendships, such as you find in people like Francis who's willing to give everything away in order to be there for others, um, that that uh, is not different from the love of God. I think uh, the the, the the challenge comes when um, another kind of love is asking us to put it above the love of God, as though, they, as though they're in competition. Um, and again, I want to say that there, there's, God only wants the fullest for us, 
and therefore there isn't any competition between life-giving human love and the love of God. But there might be competition between uh, a selfish, self-serving love and the love of God. And that's one for every friendship, every deep partnership to um, honestly pray into. I'm talking as though I have the faintest idea what I'm talking about. I mean, uh, I... Thank you, Dr. Williams, for your presentation. Um, you, you spoke about um, God's love provoking hostility. Um, I'm wondering how much you found that the theology of John Varnier gives us uh, some answers to, um, uh, to our musings on that in our increasingly uh, polarised and divided uh, world. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, he's a wonderful theologian, isn't he? Uh, and again, like um, all of these theologians I've been looking at, because he's not primarily sitting there trying to do a doctrine of God. He's speaking out of a place of practical love and service. It, beget, it gets much more vivid. You can actually see what it really means. So I think he's profoundly helpful uh, in that. Um, and, uh, and this sense that, um, that this, this real challenge at the heart of everything is... Uh, is, is, what the, is what the Genesis theologians see as, as the root of the fall, is that we always choose what uh, we want, um, even though we don't know why we want it or, or anything about it. We, we choose self-definition uh, over being defined by our relationship with God and with each other, and that that's where the hostility comes from, because we feel as though God's asking us, again, back to that first question, asking us to give up rather than offering us something. Huge. Yeah. And at the back? Hi, I'm a very new Christian. And I just want to ask a very naive question. In practical sense, in this world now, and in this century, how does one practically integrate um, God, God's relationship and cultivation of the relationship with God into the life that we live now? So how is it that we who are trying to follow Christ, and especially maybe as newer followers of Christ, might both engage with that love of God and in the world when it feels like there may be increased suffering, both for us and perhaps in the world? Does that feel right? Good. I think it is really tempting to step away from a world that is so damaged and damaging uh, and to try to concentrate more um, uh, on living a life um, uh, that's defined more by Christian faith, living in a, a much more um, closed kind of Christian uh, circle. And, and that may be a choice for some people. Um, some of the great, I mean, for example, Teresa of Avila and Julian of Norwich both chose to be, um, uh, to be nuns. To, to be to live a, a, an enclosed life and actually Teresa didn't live in at all an, an enclosed life she was hugely active um, but she chose to live as a part of a religious community um, so uh, but that is a very particular vocation and it's again if we're looking primarily at Jesus what we see is God's complete commitment to this created world God uh, loves it so much in all its damaged and damaging this that God comes to live in it. You can't actually get God saying anything much more positive um, than that. Uh, these should be two polar opposites, uh, the transcendent God uh, and, and the human being living an ordinary life. Uh, and God says, no, they're not polar opposites. They can coexist. God uh, can be found in our daily lives, and in, including in, in the pain uh, and, and the suffering. So unless... Um, and this may be something to talk to, um, to get a spiritual mentor, a spiritual director, somebody to really help you talk through what it is that God's asking of you. Um, uh, and uh, take time, don't feel you have to know all the answers now. Uh, really process it and pray it through. Um, but I would love us to, to, to think of what each one of us can do. My particular 
Um, I, I say this quite often because it continues to be a challenge. My particular challenge is to be a Christian on the tube. <laughs> I travel into London in the rush hour. Um, I can get within 30 seconds to hating everybody in that <laughs> I'm, I'm five foot two. I spend most of my time with my nose in somebody's armpit. Um, uh, and, and yet, really simply, if I can't be a Christian there, then it isn't real, this Christianity thing. If I can't, um, so I've taken to saying the Jesus prayer on the tube. Um, and uh, it's amazing what a difference it makes. And um, I suddenly find myself looking up and seeing other people that I'm pretty sure are praying. Um, I, I catch myself seeing sort of family likenesses suddenly across the tube. It is, it, and that's a really simple thing. Um, uh, uh, and there are bigger, more important things like how are we spending our money? Um, are we willing to take a little bit of time thinking about the impact of our patterns of living and spending on others who have less power and privilege than we do? Um, so don't feel that there's a, a simple answer to that. Um, take your time and let God tell you what he wants you to do, would be what I suggest. And talk to somebody wiser about it. Okay. I think it, the hardest bit of this role is disappointing those who I know would want to ask more questions. Um, but just the subtle eye contact between me and the back says we're at the end of our time. So we did want to say a huge thank you to you, Jane, for all that you've shared and all that we can still get through uh, engaging with all that you've written. Um, so would you please join me in saying a thank you?